much for joining us during this momentary distraction of simple amusements and magic. Well, good evening and good morning to you, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Chris Heron, and I am Faust, and I welcome each and every one of you on this Friday to this most peculiar place that I call Faust in Company. Now, I see that there are a lot of you out there today, and thank you once again. There are going to be audiences from the United States and the United Kingdom to see our featured guest, Sylvia Scepter, who is waiting very patiently in the green room. Now, ladies and gentlemen, I do have to say in honor of our guest today, I would like to do a short opener for her. She has traveled through time and space and also across the pond to be with us today. Ladies and gentlemen, I don't want you to change the news feed. Do not blink because we jump right into the magic right away. And so, ladies and gentlemen, let us begin with a little bit of magic.
Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. And once again, I welcome you here to Faust and Company. Now it is my great pleasure to introduce our guest of the evening and morning. You see, our guest has traveled through time and space and across the pond. She is one of the few women to be elected to the magic circle, the prestigious magic circle in London. She is a bizarre magician and also a Victorian spiritualist and most importantly, a storyteller. Please, ladies and gentlemen, welcome the mistress of the Mary Macabre, Sylvia Scepter. <laughs> Well, hello, my dear friend. Welcome for coming to Faust and Company. Cheers to you, Sylvia. Cheers to you. Well, I'm delighted to be here with you tonight. Well, I'm delighted. Thank you. Thank you so much for taking the time. I have to ask you, Sylvia, how are things in England? Terrible. Absolutely terrible. Things have got so bad. I had to get rid of all my servants. They've all gone. And I had to cut my hair. Oh, no. I know. Things are very bad here indeed. That is, it's a very bad circumstance, but you look lovely, by the way, Sylvia. Well, thank you very much. And I'm delighted to hear you call me a Victorian specialist. I actually like <laughs> that. You use it, I almost. I almost. And I'm sure there's a term for that and a definition for specialist. But to correct... Victorian spiritualist is, is the proper Yes, term. absolutely, which is a very, very serious business. It's at the cutting edge of science and technology because we can communicate like this right now. And this is via the ether. We don't even need a transatlantic cable to get us here together. We're closer now than we've ever been before in the past. It's a modern miracle. And this absolutely. means we can communicate with anyone in the future and indeed anyone in the past. That is, that is the great thing. Although this circumstance is very, very unfortunate through this pandemic, it definitely has brought a, a lot of people together through this medium that we're in today, Sylvia. And, and it's rather a fortunate event that we're here to meet in this most peculiar place. Yes. I know that you have some things to share with us, Sylvia. I do well i've got some lovely little things to share with you today so i'm just going to get them from over here wonderful so first of all i've actually got here some of my favorite things and these are witch stones also known as hag stones i've got absolutely loads of them because it's a particular hobby of mine to go looking for them when by a river or at the seaside and you said hagstones, Sylvia, yes? Hagstones, yes, as in reference to a witch or a crone, if you prefer. Ah. Hagstones or witch stone. Now, there's a reason why they're called that. And these stones, they're actually mentioned in Reginald Scott's Discovery of Witchcraft, which, as a magician, I'm sure you know all about. Now, legend has it that if you look through the hole in this stone. Now this is a hole that the ocean or the river has naturally eroded. There's no point just drilling a hole in it, it won't work. But if you get a natural stone and you peer through the holes like this, then you will get the gift of second sight. Now they're very rare and they're very hard to find, but if you keep your eyes open, you're sure to find them. And um, Reginald Scott actually, he, uh, describes in great detail. You see, he didn't just write about magic tricks, you know, he also wrote very astutely and carefully about the spells that folk people used to uh, work to achieve their inner desires and whatever it was that they were working on. So for, for example, health or to banish nightmares. Now, nightmare comes from the word where you're visited by a crone, a really horrible, ugly crone or some sort of goblin type person that yes. pounces on you in the middle of the night. I know yes. it sounds fun, but really it's not. Right. And they get 
weaveling inside your brain and they ride you all the way through into the night and you get terrible nightmares. They're riding you like a horse, hence the word mare. Now, if you tie these to your bedpost, yes. it will banish the hag. Ah. I know, it's fascinating, isn't it? So it not is. only when you look through it, you can get the gift of second sight, you will also be able to see the fairy folk. Very you... useful to see the fairy folk. You need to know when they're about. Oh, yes, the fairy folk. I'm hoping they come and clean my house. It would be good. <laughs> it would be very good. Now, also, what uh, Reginald Scott writes about is that if you can get, if you plant a herb seed and you train the herb to grow through the hole, that herb will be blessed, perhaps not blessed, but endowed with all the more magical powers. So these stones are really very useful indeed. Yes. And you can also wear around, around your neck for protection. But be very careful. If you're wearing one around your neck, you need to make sure that there's no witch finders or men of the cloth around, especially in the Middle Ages. Right. Carry Yes, I have a question, Silvio. Yeah. Now, where can we find such hagstones if we wanted to acquire them? Well, you have to go hunting for them yourself. Okay. You may be gifted them. If you're gifted one, that's that's a blessing. But yes. it's all the best to go searching by the ocean, searching by the rivers, and you'll find your very own hagstones. Well, if anyone's out there, I hope that some people would look for for those hagstones because they seem quite precious and rare. They are very precious and very rare. And as you can see, extremely useful. Yes. Hang them up outside your house as well. Banishes bad folk that will do bad things unto you. So, yes, very useful little stones. And I love them. I'm never without mine. I've got them all around the house. Well, I, I'm going to have to talk to you after this this meeting of ours so I can acquire some of my own. Absolutely. Now, would you like to know something else I've got here? Absolutely. Please, Sylvia. So let me tell you all about toads. You see, witches and toads, and indeed, actually, magicians, let's not leave them out of it, have a long, rich tradition of association altogether, because they're all agents of transformation, you see, because the toad, like the magician, uh, well, actually, no, scrap the magician bit. The toad morphs from egg to tadpole and then into toad. And then some toads actually shed their skin. And some of them, can you believe this? Some toads actually then eat their own skin, which completes the cycle of death and renewal again, you see. It's wonderful. Oh, now, yeah. in folklore, rumour has it that toads have been used for all sorts of things. And in fact, witch finders say that if you look into the eyes of a woman and you see a toad reflected, she's a witch. Ah, well, that's very good information for uh, most of us out there who don't know. Sylvia. Yes. So if you do see a toad reflected in someone's eye, be very careful indeed. Also, women who drink toad soup can control the weather. I wouldn't oh. recommend it though. And also, to the toad's poisonous secretions are very useful in spell work. Now, they're apparently, because I, I haven't tried this, obviously, they're apparently very useful if you want to return your errant lover back to their rightful spouse. Ah. And actually, I have a little toad here. There he is. I didn't realize how much toads possess such, you know, I... I I don't want to say supernatural powers, but probably natural um, uh, powers in terms of influence, it seems. I didn't know that they had those characteristics. Absolutely. Well, this is all just, well, I would say rumor, really, because let's face it, toads aren't that nice to look at. So if you do see a, a toad reflected in the eye of a woman, that's a good reason to say, oh, you are a witch. Or if you see like an imprint of a toad claw, foot. I was about to say paw, but toads don't have paws, do they? If you see the imprint of a toad foot about a woman's body, then, or a man, actually, let's not leave them out, he could also be a witch. Ah. So, going back to the poor little toad here, oh yes, and also, in my time, Victorians have an absolute obsession with entombed animals. Now, they're animals that have somehow got entombed into a stone or something and you crack the, the the stone open and then suddenly out pops a toad 
yeah. or out pops a snake and they think how on earth did they get there now some people say it was a result of the great flood during the bible during times of the bible and some who say that uh it's the work of the devil but uh, anyway back to the toad there's one toad there's one bone in the toad that is more potent than any other bone and this is this one here is the one at the very base uh-huh i see now i think that it might be from there you see that it developed into um the wishbone for the chicken because it does look a bit like a wishbone do you see yes it does anyway. it does look like a wishbone yes also i'd just like to point out that no toads were harmed in the making of this absolutely before. no no that's not now would you like to know about what else we've got down here Oh, absolutely. This is very, very curious indeed. And I love it. Thank you for sharing, Sylvia. Oh, it's my absolute pleasure to be honest with you. It's a joy to find someone that will listen to all of these stories. <laughs> oh, I think you found the right place for that. Absolutely. Then. <laughs> now, I have, well, in 1840, in the United States, actually, in the state of Maine, I'm sure you know it, Chris, it's terribly freezing cold there. They have very, very harsh winters. And uh, sadly, a story appeared in a newspaper. It was a true story about a young lady that had been picked up in a carriage and she was going off to a ball. It was a New Year's Eve ball. She was going off with her beau who put her into the back of the carriage and then they trotted off. Now, as she was going out the door, her mother warned her, Charlotte, Charlotte, put on your cloak. It's terribly cold out there tonight. And it was absolutely freezing. Charlotte did not want to ruin her party dress by wearing a cloak. Said, no, mother, what's the point in wearing such a pretty frock? If nobody sees me when I arrive, I'm just bundled up in blankets and a coat. And she dismissed her mother with a wave of her hand. So they set off on their journey through the snow and it began to blizzard. The snowflakes were falling and it was becoming colder and colder. And her beau said, who was called, um, let's call him Charlie. Her beau said, it's so cold tonight, Charlotte. I've never known it so cold. And they carried on through the snow, icier and icier. And Charlotte became fainter and fainter. And from the back he heard, I am exceeding cold. And Charlie said, we'll be there soon, Charlotte, don't worry. And Charlotte said, I'm getting a little warmer now. But when he got there, at the ball he jumped down from the carriage and went straight to the back to see charlotte and he said charlotte we're here no answer charlotte he said we're here at the ball why that why sit you there like a statue charlotte did not move at all he looked at her face and it was covered with a layer of ice she had frozen quite literally to death. Now this was a true story. And the poet Seba Smith in 1840 turned it into a very long uh, poem, which I'm not going to recite for you here because it's about 20 verses long and it will take up all night. So I just did the very condensed version there. But because of this very sad story, this poem was created. And then as a warning to young girls everywhere, not just in America, but they came to Germany and to Britain too. These little tiny dolls were made called Love. Frozen Charlottes. Can you see that? I can, absolutely. And they were put into children's desserts so that they'd find them. They'd, they'd, be, oh. they'd be cool, first of all. And they'd be a, a reminder, a memento to always listen to your parents. Ah. And they come in all sorts of shapes and sizes. Um, sometimes you can find them and they're wrapped up in their coffins. And sometimes they come with their own little doll like this one, do you see? Wonderful. Yeah. Now, Sylvia, what did, what did you say those are called again? These are called Frozen Charlottes. Frozen Charlottes. Yes. And, and the male version is, look, I've got this one here. Now he's like a little goblin. Oh, wonderful. The male version of Frozen Charlies. And you said about 18, early 1800s, these 1840. were- 1840. Yes. Wonderful, wonderful. Absolutely. So I'm actually working on a very lovely little magic effect with these 
not quite ready yet. I've had these for a while now and I've been wondering what to do with them. And it's finally hit me like a spark. So perhaps on the next show, I'll have some Absolutely. wonderful effect to share with you in a story. But they are really quite remarkable. I've had them for a while. They came from Germany. They'd been dug up in an archaeologist's dig. They found them. Well, we, we, are, we are willing to wait and to see what sort of um, magic can be contrived with these frozen Charlotte. So next time, I'm sure this won't be our last meeting. Absolutely, that would be wonderful. Now, would you like to uh, hear a little bit more about witchcraft? Uh, yes, I would. It's one of my favorite subjects at the moment. Let me just remove my mittens. Wonderful. Now, people say to me, Sylvia Scepter, were there any magicians out there or any witches that actually performed magic tricks, as in what they called juggling tricks or ledger man. And I say to them, well, actually, let me tell you about this lady. Now she was, unfortunately she doesn't have a name. Well, she did have a name, we just don't know it. But she was the unnamed lady of Cologne. Let's just say she was a little bit of a tear away. For she used to wear men's clothes. Bad. In the Middle Ages, this was a heresy. Yes. She also used to drink a lot. And what made her very interesting was that she used to go around telling folk that she was the reincarnation of Joan of Arc. And she used to perform this little magic trick with a magic wand. Abracadabra. I create as I speak. Now, I think that she performed this magic trick as a metaphor for what has been destroyed or return. That Joan of Arc's spirit of independence, her insistence that she could do, um, be as powerful and as strong as any man would live on. Now, of course, this Lady of Cologne was only performing magic tricks. She wasn't performing real magic, or was she? Good news. This unnamed magical lady of Cologne escaped. In fact, she ran off, first of all, and married a soldier. And then next, she eloped with a priest. So she really did have a fascinating life, especially for that time when women were really meant to do as they were told, quite right too. But like Joan of Arc, there were many that who were accused of witchcraft and they burned at the stake. Which, Chris, I shall very cheerily demonstrate for you right now. Just going to find my lighter. <laughs> Wonderful. Burned for the sin of performing ritual magic. Burned for the sin, oh, ow, Frankie. Ouch, I nearly set this witch on fire myself. <laughs> Burned for the sin of performing magic tricks. However, I believe that as long as we share their stories and their magic, they will live on forever. <laughs> Abracadabra. Wonderful, wonderful, Sylvia. Thank you for that wonderful story. You're very welcome. Actually, you know, it's a true story that you can find details of her in um, The Discovery of Witchcraft and also a man called Johann Nider wrote about her. So you can find she She's written a little about as footnotes in some magical history books. Um, but I, I think it's an important story to, to share. It's, she's one of the earliest examples of not only a woman performing magic tricks, but also um, of an early feminist as well. So yeah. I find that really, really interesting. Sylvia, could you repeat the name for us for some of us who want to do that research? Sure. Uh, Reginald Scott, Discovery oh. of Witchcraft. Yes. And also uh, Johann Nider. Now, you won't, well, you might find him written about. It will be highly unlikely you'll find, if you do find a copy of his book, let me know because it's been translated and translated and. It's written in, in uh, medieval German, so 
that would oh, be wow. really interesting. Yes, and my capability is all there. You know, I can communicate with people in the heavens and people down below. I really can't translate Latin or German. And neither can I, Sylvia. No. So I think we're in the same boat. But absolutely. Oh, good. I, I think people should go out and look for those books and perhaps maybe they could find something interesting. You have great stories, Sylvia. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. You're very welcome. Now, I do have something else a little to share with you. Would that be all right? Do we have, Ismail, I don't want to bore people to death. No, we have plenty of time here. Oh, oh good. And because just to let you know, there are a lot of people watching today. Oh, so. Gosh, really? How fabulous. That's marvellous, isn't it? Oh, I thought it was just you and me having a really nice chat. Anyway, <laughs> while I've been here in my parlour, all alone, I've actually been making the most of it, and I've been furthering my studies in the art of tarot, or as you Americans like to say, tarot. So <laughs> I just think they're absolutely beautiful. Now, this is the, uh, the um, design is by Pamela Coleman-Smith used to be known as Pixie, which I rather like. So we've got here the hermit. That, that must be a representation of me all alone, soul searching. Um, but they remind us that there's still adventures to come in life. They, they, they trigger sparks of conversation, which is why I really like them. And they have such wonderful symbolism to stimulate thought. And uh, they remind us to look within instead of without for answers. And they remind us that joy and happiness is just around the corner. And the number one card in the pack is, oh, there's the star, inspiration and healing, is the magician. And he reminds us that, um, he remind, well, he's actually standing in a posture. It says, as above, so below, which means that the power of the universe is within us and we can all transform our reality. Wonderful. And these little pack of cards, these are the great, great grandchildren of the tarot cards. And the correspondences between them are amazing. The 50, there are 52 cards in the pack, which correspond to the 52, um, 52 weeks in the year. There are uh, the four suits represent the four seasons, which is the four hot seasons and the four cold seasons as well. Wow. Now, what am I going to tell you about them? Um, oh yes, there are 13, 13 cards in each suit and they represent the phases of the moon. Ah. They can be used as a lunar calendar. Wonderful. Plus, if you add up all of the pips on all of the cards, they add up to 364, plus the joker, which is 365. It can be used as a solar calendar. The four, the four aces, well, they actually represent the four magical symbols of earth, air, fire, and water. And these are cards of transformation. Wonderful. I love them. <laughs> they remind us that the power of the universe is all around us and within us. Gorgeous, beautiful. aren't they? It's beautiful, Sylvia. Thank you. You're my pleasure. I may be terribly nervous then. Tell me, I thought we we're just here alone in my parlor. And now there's people out there. I'm like, oh. <laughs> <laughs> that is quite the education on cards. Even myself, I didn't know how in depth and how symbolic these cards can be. Well, absolutely. They're very, very, very old. Yes. Terribly old. The tarot cards go way back, you know, from the dawn of civilization they've been created. And I really think they're just these magical things. Now, the tarot cards that I've been using, they were designed in 1909. But the uh, the Marseille ta tarot, well, they stem back to the, the medieval times, the Middle Ages. Um, Jeff McBride knows an awful lot about tarot cards, as actually does Luke Jamey. Have you heard of him? I He's have. He's a it. wonderful um, person. He's been doing a wonderful tarot course online on Facebook, actually. Sylvia's top tip for the day, Luke Jamey's tarot class online. Brilliant. Luke Jermaine. Yes. Now, I think we come to the time when we talk a little bit more about witches. Would you like that? Oh, I'd love that. Oh, good. Excellent. 
I'm going to scoot forward now back to an era which I feel entirely comfortable with, <laughs> which is the Victorian times. Now, um, the theme of, of referring to women as witches has carried on. So, for example, I've got these cards here. Can you see them? I can, yes. Oh, good. So Helen Duncan, uh, she was nicknamed Churchill's witch. Um, that there was a, she was the last person to be charged under the Witchcraft Act of 1784, I think it was. Uh, but there was a rumour, and I believe it is just a rumour, that Winston Churchill went to see her for spiritual advice. Anyway, she got, a, she got known as Church, Winston Churchill's witch in the kind of the red top media. Yes. Eusapia Palladino, very interesting medium. Now, she was married to a magician, in fact, and that she's looking particularly wild there. Yeah. She doesn't always look that wild. Interesting. Um, she does. She's letting it all, she's really letting it rip there, isn't she? Um, <laughs> but she actually, when she held her seances, now this is something I don't do, but she said to people, now watch me carefully because I cheat, which I'm sure you'll agree, Chris, is a very magical and magician-y thing to say, isn't it? Yes, it is. It is. Now, have we got here? Yeah. <laughs> Mina Crandon of Boston. Now, I'm sure you probably have heard of her. Have you heard of her? The, the name sounds familiar, but please. Oh, well, I'll give you another name that she was known by, Marjorie, the Witch oh. of Boston. Now, um, she was a very interesting character. She used to have um, a spirit voice who used to communicate with all of the sitters, and he was called Walter quite a controlling chap, and also, it's very interesting, you know how some mediums, not myself, I don't do it, terribly vulgar, but they manifest ectoplasm. Oh, yes. That. Now, she used to manifest e ectoplasm, and it used to make the form of a hand, and this hand used to flop out onto the table in front of her and used to stroke people. Oh. Can you imagine? I anyway, <laughs> I digress. As you can see, they're, they're all different. Um, Nina Crandon, Cora L.V. Scott, Colin Evans from Cardiff, got caught several times. Florent Cook, yes. Now, we are connected but apart. But we really, we're connected so close through the ether. You could be right here in my parlour with me. And in fact, tonight I have asked some spirits to join me. I always do. They're more than welcome here. I just want you to tune in, Chris, into your sense of heightened intuition, your sense of knowing, your connection to the universe and to God, if you like. And I want you to tune in. And I'm just going to lift a very small packet of cards and turn them over. And I want you to say now when you're ready, now. There. Marvellous. Yeah. Turn those over. And now as so we get right deep, really deep into your sense of intuition, your sense of knowing, we're going to cut a larger amount. So when you're ready, just say now, Chris. Now. There. We'll just turn that little lot over. Oh. Alice Windle. Dreadful mm. woman. Anyway, let's have a look see where you've cut to. There we go. If you'd cut one more, you'd got to that one. Okay. You see. Oh, so Oliver Lodge. Dreadful ball. <laughs> but as it is, you cut to this one just here. Now, I don't want to see who it is just yet. So okay. I'm going to hold it up to you, Chris. And I'm going to avert my eyes, all right? So here we are. Okay. Can you see who that is? Yes, I can. Oh, good. I Yes. Do you, do you know? Well, it doesn't matter if you know them or not, or her, or him. <sighs> now, I'm set, well, here in the room with me, right now, I know that I have, well, I've got my lovely cat over there in the corner, Cinderella. She's one presence. I'm actually sensing... Well, I'm sensing three, to be honest with you. So I'm sensing my, yes, more, more than, definitely more than one. Two, two, who is it? 
Who is it? Who who did you see on the card? I saw the Fox sisters. Kate and Maggie, my two favourite magical minxes. Wonderful. Do you know, they're actually credited with starting off the whole spiritualist craze. But of course, it did go on. Necromancy used to be known, calling for the spirits. I'm so glad you've tuned into them. And there's a reason for that, Chris. It's because over here, shrouded in my morning shawl, is a picture of Kate and Maggie Fox. Now, I know, so you really have tuned into your own sense of spiritual guidance there. I believe you might have a gift yourself. Now we're going to take this one step further. We're going to call them forth. Let's see if they'll communicate with us tonight. I will use this. Now this is a traditional method now, not just Victorian, this went all the way back to Reginald Scott as well in Discovery of Witchcraft, that book again, where he writes about a method for calling forth a spirit and trapping it inside a glass or in fact inside a crystal. Now, we're not going to trap Kate and Maggie tonight because that would be cruel. No cruelty to spirits will happen here. But we are going to call them forth. Come forward, Kate and Maggie. Come forward and strike the glass not too hard. I don't want the glass to shatter. Come forward and tap the glass. Now you can see it here, there's no interference, nothing there. Chris, you're actually our medium tonight. Would you please call, for, call them forward? Say, come forward, Maggie and Kate. Come forward and tap the glass. Come forward, Maggie and Kate. Come forward, Maggie and Kate, and tap the glass. Thank you. I think you might need to be a little bit more assertive. You got it. Come forth, Maggie and Kate. Come forth, Maggie and Kate, and tap the glass. Shh. Did you hear that? I did. Very faintly. Kate and Maggie, come forward and tap the glass. Oh, those minxes. They're not doing anything for me. Try it again, please, Chris. Come forth, Maggie and Kate, and tap the glass. <sighs> Stronger. They're here. That was very strong. Felt it as well. I felt the presence in my gut. Ask them, Chris. Ask them if they're, if they're happy to communicate with us tonight. Maggie and Kate, are you okay to communicate with us tonight? Yes. I do feel rather queer though. I do feel as if there might be another presence here. Yes, there is another presence here. I've got a horrible feeling it actually might be Mr. Splitfoot. Do you know what happened? What no. they actually said was what they actually said was that um, Mr. Splitfoot was their poltergeist, and they they got debunked basically. They said it was all a fraud, and then when they died, <gasps> did you see that? I did. The frame. Okay. I mean, all right. I'm sensing an angry spirit, and I think it's because. Well, we need to send them back anyway. We'll light the candle. I'm so sorry, Kate and Maggie. Kate and Maggie, hail and farewell. Would you bid them hail and farewell? Maggie and Kate, I bid you farewell. Thank you because they both said that Mr. Splitfoot wasn't real. And then on their deathbeds, both of them said, no, Mr. Splitfoot was real. I guess the truth, as they say, is out there. I do feel slightly strange. I think perhaps, I think perhaps I should go. Can I? May I bid you farewell? 
Yes, you may, Sylvia. Oh, the candle. The candle is guttering. Or sp Oh, wow. I need to leave. Farewell. Farewell, Sylvia. Farewell. Ladies and gentlemen, Sylvia Scepter. I think the spirits have preoccupied our featured guest, and I do hope all of you have enjoyed. If you want to find Sylvia Scepter, you can find her here at sylviascepter.com, and you can also follow her on Facebook as well as Instagram. Ladies and gentlemen, it is a great pleasure to have you all here today, and I hope that you have all enjoyed our today's episode. So my name is Chris Heron, and I am Faust, and that was our guest, Sylvia Scepter. I bid you all cheers, good night, and good afternoon. <laughs>